Hey, everybody, it's time for another PC Perspective Mailbag. Uh, uh, we're going to keep it short. You know what? I say this every time. It doesn't matter anymore. Um, if you have questions for us, leave them in the comments section of this YouTube video. Leave them on the comments section at PCPer.com. Uh, we really need your questions to continue this going. And so far, it's been pretty great. We're in our 16th episode of it. So four straight months or so of doing these mailbags for you. They're pretty cool. I think they're informative. I think they're useful. It's good to be able to engage and answer questions directly from the audience. So anything you have, send them our way. We're looking forward to it. First question comes from Ronnie AM. Uh, says a video from YouTube claimed that customers were quote conned by the Intel Core i5 8400 reviews, mentioning its very low base clock speed, the lack of low cost motherboards, and that reviewers received cherry picked samples. It's also a non K part, so users are stuck with what they get. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I don't. I don't know which part of that phrase, that of that that accusation, I guess, in any way indicates that somebody was conned. The Core i5-8400 is a low base clock speed. Um, it doesn't have overclocking. It's not. It's a non-K part. All these are very well understood things. Um, the lack of low-cost motherboards for uh, the Coffee Lake systems is was unfortunate. It's something that's already, we can already see changing in the market. Um, but usually when you have these first initial releases, that's kind of what you expect to see, right? Um, higher end boards. And especially considering the move from Cavi Lake to Coffee Lake was very quick. It was abrupt. Probably some of these motherboard vendors were were still catching up with, with this whole new mentality of branding and they had to change some things around. Um, I would expect this to be a longer term thing uh, before you start to see those low cost boards. I, I don't understand what anybody would be conned about. Um, I think the reviews, including ours, uh, made it very straightforward um, about what it was and what the performance is, what the price is. Obviously, you have to take into account other aspects of a system when building and, and pricing something out. So um, you've got to look into that yourself, I guess, uh, if we don't mention it specifically in the review. So um, Ron, if you have any other specific things that maybe you left out of that question that you want me to address, I'm more than happy to do so. I don't think... I don't know what what other video you're talking about, but uh, I don't think anybody was conned by the Core i5-8400. It's a part that came out with specifications, and they, there you go. And we reviewed it and tested the performance and gave you our opinion on it. So uh, let's see. We have, oh, man, good luck pronouncing this name, Ryan. Uh, Gregor Weresco. We're going to go with that asks, why does RX Vega 56 perform so closely to Vega 64? With Vega 64's extra shaders, I was expecting a larger performance difference between the two cards. Um, yeah, so they do perform pretty close in some instances. Uh, and what you're really seeing is the effect of bottlenecks on a GPU architecture, or I'm sorry, the bottlenecks of a GPU architecture on a graphics card as a whole. All right? Keep in mind that the memory subsystem is the same between them. And in some cases, in, in some games, in some scenarios, the memory architecture is going to be uh, a more significant factor um, than it would be in other cases. Not that, that GPU it's ever going to be more important than GPU compute uh, that goes into the graphics side of it, but the memory maybe is affecting a higher percentage of the workload. And in that case, because the memory speed is the same, the technology is the same, the capacity is the same, that kind of homogenizes a lot of that performance data. Also, you know, the, the, the shader delta between 56 and 64 isn't really that dramatic, right? Um, and if you look at the difference between the 64 and the 56, um, it's more narrow than the GTX 1070, the 1080, but not by a significant margin again, right? So this is something that we deal with a lot. In general, the flagship part is always going to be a lower value per performance unit than the next step down, right? And that's kind of in general, right? The 1080, um, was a good part, but the 1070 was a better performance per dollar part. Now, if you compare that to the 1080 Ti, the 1080 is a better performance per dollar part than the 1080 Ti. So the same thing happens there. So the Vega 56 is a better performance per dollar part. And even when we were doing our initial briefings with AMD, I remember being told by uh, Scott Horkelman at AMD that like the Vega 56 was going to be this one that was going to change things. This is the one that they knew was going to be the most popular product. And they were right. They were right, and that's what caused NVIDIA to respond with the GTX 1070 Ti even. So not a surprise there, I guess. Gert, ta Gert Tractor? Tar Tarkter? I don't know if that's misspelled or what. And wants to know, is the efficacy of HDR limited by the native contrast ratio of a monitor's panel technology? 
For example, would HDR be less impressive on an IPS monitor because IPS panels have relatively poor black levels? Um, this is correct, right? HDR is two things. One, it is um, very wide brightness ratios, right? Contrast ratios. Uh, and two, it, it, is, it is better color depth, right? The ability to produce more colors on the screen. Um, the, 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 your example of an IPS monitor having relatively poor black levels inherently means that the ratio between the best dark and the best bright you can get is going to be worse on an IPS monitor than it would be, say, on an OLED, right? So many people who look at an OLED screen for the first time, even if it's not an HDR, think they're looking at HDR if they've heard about that technology because the black levels of OLED are so uh, impressive, right? Um, now, that being said, that's why monitor technologies, TV technologies, phone technologies are all adapting to it. Um, keep in mind that, you know, a standard like the monitors I'm looking at here, these Apple displays had peak brightness of 350 um, lumens or, uh, yeah, candelas per meter, meter squared, however you want to measure it, I guess. Uh, whereas some of the newer HDR TVs and displays that we assume have like a thousand as its peak brightness, right? So um, there's gonna be a huge range there and the darker dark you can get, the brighter bright you can get, the, the wider the, the gap and the more effective, that's a great term to use, Gert, uh, the HDR effect will be, the greater the impact the HDR image will have. If you're around display technologies at all, you can kind of, if when you see a good HDR display, you know immediately what you're looking at. Uh, we've had two different HDR displays here in the office, monitors, that we haven't really done reviews on because when we look at them, they don't look that much better. They're HDR by minimum spec, uh, but in many cases, they just don't, they didn't wow us in the way that we would expect it to do. So we didn't spend a whole lot of time with it and our reviews times, our, our uh, cycle times with them were relatively short. Um, so we'll, we'll have some other info on that soon. So we're still waiting for those wow HDR monitors to really hit us. We've had the TVs. I've got that LG that we did a story on a while back um, <clears throat> in the TV market, but for PCs, not there yet. Karsten M wants to know, why do NVIDIA and AMD still use blower designs for the reference GPUs when almost every third-party cooling solution seems to work better and operate quieter? Uh, that was a good, this is a good question. It's one that I had several years ago until I talked with uh, a systems partner of NVIDIA and AMD. And essentially, the, the, the advantages of a blower cooler is that it exhausts the air out of the system as opposed to uh, a standard two or three fan cooler, what it does is it does cool the heat sink on the GPU, but it doesn't exhaust the air out of the system. It kind of recirculates the air inside the system and you have to depend on other you know, fans and, and cooling techniques to get the air circulated through the rest of the rig. Why AMD and NVIDIA build blower styles is because for OEMs, somebody like Falcon Northwest, for example, who is building small form factor machines, they need to be able to validate a cooler design for a certain wattage level for all these other components included as well. And as part of that, if you're doing small form factor, the blower design is much more effective, right? Because you are getting that air out of there. So even though it's it's not a, it won't cool as well in an open air environment or in a larger case environment, and it's more noisy in those cases too, um, the repeatability, um, the ability to validate once over the course of the entire GTX 10 series design and, and be comfortable with that is really is really what drives that, right? Um, and it's not just Falcon Northwest, it's all these guys that are building machines <clears throat> that are gonna do multi-GPU, that are gonna do um, anything else to that effect. They wanna have these standardized designs and the exhausting of air out of the system gives them a big advantage, right? So um, for most DIY users, if you're in a standard ATX chassis, it's not really a problem. And if anything, it's gonna just create more noise that is kind of annoying to you. So that's why if you look at EVGA and ASUS and MSI and Gigabyte and all these guys, they're using almost exclusively non-blower designs for their custom options, right? And they, you know, they offer a blower design, but it's always the lowest cost uh, option as well. So that, that is why those still exist and why I foresee that they will continue to exist. 
Trilling for Dollars wants to know, what do you recommend for backup software? I'm looking for something that's free or very inexpensive, can do automated backups, automated deletion of earlier backups after a set time, and it would be great if things could also create image files. There's a lot of requests. Um, our backup systems here at the office, as I type to make sure, because a lot of times these names run together for me, uh, we use Backblaze. So uh, Backblaze is an online, is a cloud-based backup system. It has versioning. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, a personal backup for it is, let's see, um, I'm going to double check. I got the pricing right here. It's $50 a year for unlimited data on your Mac or PC per computer, right? Uh, that's pretty awesome. And that even counts like if you have a network attached storage device that counts towards it. Um, so we have multiple terabytes of data backed up to their systems and we love it. It's fast. Um, now it's not perfect because it does take a long time. If you have a, if you have a, a, a standard kind of broadband uh, ethernet connection or internet connection and you're trying to upload you know, five terabytes of data, it's going to take a very long time. Uh, we have a gigabit connection, so we were able to do it relatively quick. I think we were able to do like 200 megabits per second upstream to them to get all the data in. But that's my, that's my selection. Now, it doesn't do, as far as I know, image files of like your whole system, um, but it does have the ability to restore all of your data. If your machine crashes, you got a format, you can restore all of your data back down to it. Another thing that I use that is not exactly what you're talking about in terms of automated backups, uh, I should say Backblaze does have a client that runs on Windows or Mac and it constantly is checking for new files and uploads and updates them. Um, I also use Dropbox. That's not technically just like backup software, but I find it incredibly useful and I have a lot of confidence in it because all of my important files are, are synced across different PCs, so it kind of basically means you have a lot of different backups of things. Uh, they do versioning. It's it's a one terabyte of data for no, two terabytes of data. You know, one terabyte of data for a hundred bucks a year. So it's much more expensive, but it's it's features and capability are are pretty dramatically different than what Backblaze offers too. So if anybody else has other suggestions for local stuff, which I don't do a lot of anymore, um, I just kind of depend on the cloud based backups. Uh, feel free to let us know in the comments. Guy B wants to know, when are the Ryzen 5 and 7 laptops coming out? I want eight cores to finally be available in a laptop. A couple things. One, I believe that Asus Ryzen, the Ryzen desktop notebook, if you will, uh, is shipping. I forget what the model number of is it, or num model number of it is. Uh, however, um, I, what I hope you're talking about is the Ryzen parts, the Ryzen mobile parts that have the integrated APU uh, graphics on them. Those are actually supposed to start shipping here in the next 10 days or so based on my conversations with AMD. Um, that would be awesome. I'm actually really eager to test these out and try them. Now, those are quad core, not eight core systems. So it's worth keeping in mind, but they do have integrated Vega graphics. If you haven't read up about those, you can go to pcpro.com. We have a story uh, uh, still on the front page of the article section looking at what Ryzen mobile brings or should bring to the, to the table uh, in terms of thin and light notebooks. Uh, if you want eight cores, uh, you want that Ryzen uh, Asus desktop machine that has to have discrete graphics in it. Uh, you can get eight cores in it, but you're going to have, it's a very thermally limited infrastructure for this, right? So you're not going to have, you know, the eight core performance of a Ryzen 7 part on your desktop, obviously, but you'll, you'll get some impressive results there. Uh, and I, like I said, I think that's available. I think that's available now. V8 Flexen wants to know, with many more monitors now supporting FreeSync compared to G-Sync, do you think that NVIDIA will ever offer a dongle that allows GeForce GPUs to support adaptive refresh with FreeSync? Or do you think NVIDIA will write it out with G-Sync even if it dies from lack of market saturation? Um, so yes, there are there are significantly more monitors supporting FreeSync than G-Sync in terms of quantity today. That's that's absolutely the fact. Uh, AMD's growth there has been, has been pretty impressive. Um, NVIDIA doesn't, wouldn't have to offer a dongle to support it. They would just have to enable it in the driver, right? Like the monitors um, for FreeSync just basically support an adaptive sync feature that is a subset of a DisplayPort feature set, right? So they could do it in software if they if they chose to do it, and they have just decided to not do it. Um, you, you asked the question of, will NVIDIA ride it out with G-Sync even if it dies from lack of market saturation? Uh it doesn't have to have market saturation to survive. It just has to be uh, 
a feature that people look for and ask for and that monitor vendors are willing to sell products based on. Now, the, uh, the question is, is NVIDIA, do they want to make money on the monitors or do they want to keep people inside the GeForce ecosystem um, as much as possible because they think they have the best technology. And it's, it's definitely the latter there. They, they believe they have the best technology and they also believe people should be willing to pay a little bit, but a little bit more for it because it is better than the competitions. Um, if you believe that's the case, that's a reasonable assertion. That's a reasonable next step to take. Uh, obviously since the day one of G-Sync and day one of FreeSync, this has been an argument that we've had and a discussion that has that has continued and will continue about NVIDIA supporting, like there's no reason NVIDIA can't support FreeSync monitors while also supporting G-Sync monitors. If NVIDIA believes G-Sync monitors are truly better than FreeSync monitors, they can continue to push that program, they can continue um, to have partners build those systems, they can improve the technology as they go while still supporting the FreeSync monitors that exist out there. Uh, but if you do that, it's almost an admission that that G-Sync wasn't, wasn't as successful as you thought it was going to be or that it's not that much better than FreeSync anymore. So um, we'll just have to see how that goes. It's another CES coming up. We'll see more of the HDR, G-Sync, and FreeSync competition heat up. And I don't expect any changes, but there you go. Kate Wolf asks, good old Kate, is it possible to upgrade the new Xbox One X with an SSD? If so, would the SSD reduce game load times? Um, so I haven't seen a teardown of the Xbox One X yet that focuses on it. We've been able to do that for pretty much every other console. The PlayStation 4 made it super, super easy to do. The Xbox One X could do it, but you had to have specific imaging software to do it. Um, so we'll have to see. We'll find out here in the next couple of days whether or not that's something that can happen at all. Um, in general, yes, the SSD will reduce game load times over hard drive. Now, the, the question is, is how, by how much? Is it by 10%? Is it by 50%? Is it by 5%? Uh, and that's yet to be determined. And as our testing went into, uh, Jim did some testing with the PlayStation 4 Pro, uh, where we loaded some games on SSDs versus hard drives versus hybrid hard drives. And the differences were dramatic in some games, but almost unnoticeable in other games. So it really comes down to how they load the game in, uh, what the bottleneck of the system happens to be. Uh, I think it just goes to assume that it will be faster a little bit at, at most, or at, at least at least, um, uh, uh, but it will be probably be significantly faster in some other instances. So we'll have to see how that, how that pans out. Andrew SC wants to know, aside from overclocking, what is the real difference between an i7-8700 and an i7-8700K? The base frequency of the non-K part seems low, but in the world of boost and turbo frequencies, how relevant is the base clock really? That's a good question. Um, so the real difference between the 8700 and 8700K is the overclock ability, the ability to adjust multiplier, right? If you don't care about that and you just look at the base specifications of the parts, the differences are in the rated clock speeds. The base clock is lower, and the kind of boost turbo clocks, I think, are a little bit lower as well. Now, what you're hitting on is that the, the base clock is significantly lower than the K part, right? Um, but what that actually turns into is a question of does the base clock really matter that much? And the truth is, not really. Uh, the base clock is there as a minimum spec for as long as you have the uh, thermal rating on your cooler that Intel demands that you will never drop below that frequency when running all cores. Um, so as long as you're doing that, you don't have to worry about it. Now, most of the time, uh, an enthusiast, a DIY user has a much better cooling solution than the base Intel option. So you don't really hit that base clock, at least not that we've seen in our, in our cases. So for a lot of people, uh, the A700 is going to be just fine. Now, your turbo clocks are still a little bit lower, even if it's a 1 or 200 megahertz. It's going to it's going to mean a little bit there. Uh, but in terms of cost savings, if that's your if that's your angle, just go with uh, just go with the 8700. All right, let's see. Uh, let's do one more question here. Dan McLeod, McLeod, MacLeod. McLeod. We'll go with that. Uh, I would like to build a PC for both gaming and to function as a Plex server. Would a Ryzen 5 1600 with six cores, 12 threads be enough to transcode video and provide enough threads for gaming? Also, should I set up the Plex server in a VM to limit the number of cores it can use? Or will Windows balance the cores used so I can play games at the same time? Um, I would not 
count on Windows to make the appropriate thread scheduling decisions to allow you to play games and transcode video effectively at the same time. Uh, I don't know that it won't do that. I don't know that it that it can't do that. We've done some tests with Threadripper uh, where we looked at playing games while doing rendering, right? And uh, it Windows actually does pretty well with that. It, it seems to recognize the threads that are, are um, higher priority, uh, require lower latency game threads. But I, I wouldn't count on it. That seemed to differ based on the, the other workload going on as well as what the game developer might have done in terms of giving Windows the right information about what these threads are actually doing. Um, you can put a Plex server in a VM to kind of uh, alleviate some of that, if you will, but you get another complications. Um, you could also use, uh, now I'm blanking on the name of some of these tools, look up, Google some tools that allow you to set uh, processor thread affinity, right? So you could actually do this without a VM. You could um, use these tools to tell uh, Windows, hey, when this process loads, only use these four threads or whatever it happens to be, right? Now, the, the detriment to that is then your your Plex server will only have access to those particular threads. Um, so it depends on what, what you're doing uh, doing this for. I, I think the Ryzen 5 is enough for a a single person. It depends on how many people you have streaming or how much transcoding your Plex server is actively doing at any given time. How often will you be gaming and your Plex server be transcoding at the same time that you have to worry about those types of things? Obviously, if you're super worried about it, increasing your core count, increasing your thread count is going to be the most beneficial thing there. I mean, our Plex server here that we share amongst our group is running a thread ripper, right? And it was only doing transcoding because sometimes we have multiple people watching at the same time and it's doing transcoding. So that's, that's just how it works. We're not doing gaming on the machine at the same time. Um, I would just kind of reiterate, I wouldn't trust Windows to make the right decision. It might for your scenarios. It might be worth trying. Um, but uh, I know setting it up and deconstructing and then resetting up the Plex machines and servers and stuff can be a pain. So I uh, hope that helps. Uh, that's going to be it for us. Uh, uh, for me for this week, guys, leave me a question in the comments of this YouTube video or on PCPro.com that is associated with this video as well. We'll go through those and have some more answers for you next week. And if you have any comments on the answers that we gave you here, please feel free to put those in there as well. We can kind of keep this as an ongoing discussion as we go on some of this stuff. So thanks everybody for, for hanging out and for watching uh, PCPro.com. Check out all of our reviews and content there. Uh, if you like these types of videos and stuff and want to see them continue, go to patreon.com slash PCPro and you can support us that way as well. We super appreciate it. It and we'll see you next week, guys. Thanks.